Yes, we can see your screen, Shabazz. All right, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Shabazz. I'm a product manager in the Azure Network Security Customer Experience Engineering team here at Microsoft. Today, myself and my colleague Toby will be talking about Azure Web Tuning for web applications. So when we look at the agenda here, uh, we'll start with the introduction, which will cover uh, some of the resources we have, like the tech community and GitHub resources, and then we'll talk about Azure Web Application Firewall overview. Uh, and then we'll jump into the WAP configuration side of things, which will cover WAP policies, rule sets, and how to tune your Azure WAP. Uh, finally, we'll cover a couple of scenarios uh, for the demo side of things, and then we'll also cover some uh, question and answers later. All right, let's get started here. Uh, the first slide I have is for the uh, Azure Network Security Resources. Uh, I just wanted to highlight some of the resources we have. The first one out there is the feedback form. We highly encourage everybody to uh, give feedback uh, going to this link. Uh, this will help us reflect on the webinars and also improve for the future webinars. Um, this next resource we have is the Ninja training. Uh, this is a comprehensive training on Azure Network Security and Network Security in general which will uh, provide you with rich knowledge that will uh, help you improve your knowledge on the Azure NetSec products. Uh, the next, next uh, resource we have is the GitHub repository. Um, it is our Azure Network, Network Security repository, which has a lot of resources like uh, templates, workbooks, and queries and detection queries and everything. So uh, if at all you're uh, uh, deploying the NetSec products from Azure, these resources will be really helpful. And on top of that, if you have any resources that you want to share with the customers or anybody else, you can also submit a pull request to this repository. Therefore, we can add it to our GitHub repository as well. Uh, then the next resource we have is the tech community resource where we publish blogs on recent additions and uh, you know feature releases of the network security products. Uh, we also cover some common use cases and uh, uh, also, uh, you know, some best practices on the NetSec product. So this is this is a good resource. If at all you're looking to deploy any of the NetSec products, we might have already covered it in this uh, blogs. So please go and check it out once. Also on this particular webinar uh, for WAF tuning, we have published a recent blog just yesterday. So please go to this AZ NetSec blogs and check out this recent blog on Azure WAF tuning. And then the final resource that I have there is the security webinars. So this particular link has uh, all the links for our previous webinars. So if at all you're interested in any of the topics that we've covered in the past, uh, please uh, feel free to check them out and get benefited from that. All right, so let's jump into the topic here, which is our Azure WAF. Um, so what is Azure WAF? So basically it's a web application firewall, which is cloud native uh, and uh, highly scalable and uh, you know, protects your web application from uh, different sorts of attacks, vulnerabilities and everything. So uh, it comes with, uh, you know, it has two variants, which is a global WAF and regional WAF. The regional WAF comes with the app gateway and uh, the global WAF is the one with the front door. Uh, so how it protects uh, from the uh, web attacks is it has various features like managed rule sets, which are powered by Microsoft Threat Intelligence, uh, which will protect us from OWASP Proc 10 attacks. Uh, which is like out of the box rules that you don't have to uh, do anything there. Just turn on the WAF and you are protected from all of these OWASP top 10 attacks. Uh, there's uh, bot protection rule sets as well, uh, which will uh, protect our applications from the uh, well-known bots, uh, malicious bots, uh, which is powered by Microsoft Threat Intelligence as well. So uh, from the Microsoft Threat Intelligence feed, we'll get some, uh, we'll get the information on. Uh, good bots, bad bots and everything, and thereby we can protect our applications from that as well. And then we have the flexibility and provision for creating custom rules as well. Uh, so with the help of custom rules, we can we can uh, get more specific about what kind of traffic we want to allow or deny on top of the managed rule set. So we have we can create custom rules basing upon geo filtering, IP restriction, HTTP parameters, and size restriction as well. So that's also a good feature to have. Uh, on top of that, uh, in the uh, Azure Network Edge, that is the global WAP with front door, we also have conditional rate limiting where we can uh, limit the number of requests that are coming to the uh, web application uh, at a given duration of time. So that will help us with, uh, you know, bombarding of uh, incoming, uh, protecting from a large number of requests that are coming in. 
and uh, thereby not affecting the availability of the application. We also have support for API protection and DevOps integration. We support J JSON, XML, and multipart. And also uh, in the DevOps integration side, we can build, manage, and uh, deploy uh, uh, with the help of ARM templates, REST API, uh, PowerShell, CLI, and Terraform. So, which will uh, help us with uh, managing our environment easily. Uh, we also have support for WAF insights, which will give us detailed information on, um, you know, uh, the traffic that is passing through the uh, WAF uh, with the help of uh, Azure Monitor. We can also get uh, detailed log information, thereby we can troubleshoot uh, the uh, live traffic and also tune our WAF accordingly. We also have integration with uh, Sentinel, which is our cloud native SIEM solution, uh, which will help us with uh, workbooks, uh, which is like uh, a workbook is basically a dashboard that will give you clear insights on the uh, traffic that is passing through the web application firewall. Uh, thereby, it will give you information on what traffic is getting blocked, what kind of requests we are getting in a uh, you know clean and uh, detailed fashion. Uh, we also have integration with uh, Azure Policy Enforcement, which is uh, basically uh, covering the governance side of things on uh, what kind of features you want to have in, in a particular WAF deployment. So you can govern those features and have consistency uh, throughout your uh, setup. On top of all of this, uh, Azure WAF protects uh, web application not only in Azure, but also outside of Azure, uh, basically in hybrid clouds and multi-cloud scenarios as well. Um, so it, we can also protect applications on the on-prem side as well, uh, because App Gateway supports on-prem uh, backend tools uh, here as well. So this is the overview of Azure WAF. Uh, I just want to uh, pause there and hand it over to Toby to cover WAF policies and rule sets, and then I'll come back and cover the WAF tuning side of things. Toby, it's all yours. Hi everyone, can you hear me, Shabazz? Yes, we can get it. All right, thank you uh, for joining us. So uh, my name is Toby and I'll continue from here for the next couple of minutes. And uh, so from where Shabazz stopped, some of the things that he has described, the plan is that, OK, how best do we provide your endpoints? You have applications in your environment and you want to optimize for quick delivery and content acceleration. So we are thinking, what is the best way to tune WAF in terms of performance? security and making sure that that content is served legitimately to those who are rightly requested for it. So the way WAF works is, um, as it is right now, we currently have WAF working with app delivery platforms like Prondo and App Gateway. Now, these app delivery platforms, they work as a reverse proxy. So in your regular firewall, everything is explicitly denied. No traffic is permitted until you create an access control list and you can say, OK, I want traffic to come from left to go to the right. Is the other case in layer seven when you are using app gateway or Fondo as a reverse proxy, which means everything is permitted by default. So how do you reduce what gets your endpoint? So there are some traffic that are not supposed to get to your endpoint, but because they are supposed to, but because they eventually get to your endpoint and they cannot be served, now your endpoint has to give a response and say, okay, this page you're looking for is not available, or server is unavailable, or that path doesn't exist. So the idea is if you have 2 million requests getting to your endpoint, and only 2,000 out of the 2 million can be served, then that means your endpoint is doing a lot of work, the processing, the, the it's resource intensive to process all of those requests when only a few of those are legitimate. So the idea of creating this work policy is, can I look for patterns to, to say, okay, everything is permitted for now, but not everything is requested. Everything, not everything is legitimate. So how do I find a pattern to deny what's not legitimate? That's exactly what we're going to be trying to do in WAF tuning, to reduce the noise that gets to our endpoint using our WAF. And WAF, as we know it, you can create WAF in three different categories. So uh, you can create WAF in, uh, at, at three different levels. You can create it at a global scope. You can create it as a um, HTTP or browser scope, and you can create it, uh, you can also create it as a URI scope. And that's what you can see in this uh, image here. Either as glow, at, um, you can also create it um, right now on the app gateway and front of, like I mentioned earlier. And that way you, you can use the three different levels that we just mentioned to create an overarching um, protection across your environment. So the global work policy means every application, everything behind your app gateway or front door 
is protected by one WAF policy. Now, sometimes you have different kind of applications that require different type of security standards. They are they require, they require different kind of security operations. So because of that, you cannot just create one rule to serve everything. And we're going to see some examples like that towards the end of this presentation. There are some, there are some things that are permissible when you have SQL database in your backend, and there are some things that you don't want to do when you don't have SQL uh, in your database. So do, sometimes some, some pages are very, very sensitive. For instance, payment gateway interfaces. Uh, you, uh, you have some pages where you have uh, customer login into like banking gateways. Those are supposed to be protected and they can't have the same security setting as your landing page where all you just do is just provide information for customer about your business. So in that situation, you go beyond global WAF, you create a per site WAF and say, okay, for this particular site, I'm going to create a policy and this policy is just going to be for this website alone. That way, the, there is the, that particular one that you have created is a bit more custom than the global one. And the idea of that is you cannot create much more custom and tighter rules on that per site policy. Now, because it's custom, it will get a priority over the global work policy. So again, it's like, I always use an example for a lot of people who might be new. When they call, like when somebody um, tries to send a package to your house, if they use your house address, that's the global work policy there. But when they now put your apartment number, then that's precise because that is specific to your house, to your apartment, maybe level apartment 413. Then you can even go further, say you have five people living in that apartment and you want it to just be for one person in the apartment. Now you go to per URI, so you can go to that you are the, the universal resource locator. You can go to that um, particular resource in that website and say, okay, does this particular part of this website is where I want it to be? So you can even go for that. So you have these three layers of customizing your security levels. So the global is more permissive, while the per URI is the most restrictive. So you want to use all of those behind your app gateway or your app delivery platform to save different levels of security policies. All right, so um, uh, we currently are trying to, we are currently facing the going away from WAF config, but that is what comes by default to your old applications. So we are moving to WAF policy. WAF policy is, WAF config comes by default with your app gateway, but we are going to use WAF policy because it's easier to configure and you can configure a different scope and layer as mentioned earlier. So WAF rule set. Now, now I've described how WAF works. I've talked about the different scope as which you can apply your WAF. And I've also described how WAF is designed based on reverse proxy because everything is permitted until there is a match. Now, what are these matches about? Now, the matches are based on the kind of attacks that can happen. They have been created. Matches are, I, want, I don't want this kind of um, request coming to my environment because I don't have a PHP application or I don't, I'm not serving web, um, Outlook web access. So any, any of such kind of requests coming into my environment, I want them to be blocked. I don't want people from a particular location coming to my environment. I don't want people using Tor browser coming into my environment. I don't want um, SQL injection queries. I don't want all of these parameters coming towards my environment at all. How do I create that? I need to create a pattern matching like rule says, something that looks for this kind of pattern and then stops them. So we use the OWASP protection for those who might not be um, familiar with that. And we use that to create, uh, we use that because it's open source. It has a very, very huge library of um, rule groups that look into different types of classification of this type of um, attack patterns. And they've been classified into the different types. Uh, we can, we're going to see them here. And uh, currently, we, we we use that rule set and we, we use those to create the rule set that we use and we add that with our bot, man, uh, bot manager and we also have custom rule set as well, which we're going to talk in, in, in detail. Right now, we have the stable release of 3.2 as the latest one in our environment and we'll be having um, a new release uh, in a little while. And uh, what happens is each of these releases have new updates with them. It's open source, as I mentioned earlier. And the rules have been created into different rule groups. So for instance, for SQL injection, that's a rule group. And when you go into the SQL injection rule group, you see all the types of SQL injection as rule sets, as, as a rule set in itself. If you look into RCE for remote code execution, there are different types of remote code execution. So RCE, we have different types of uh, rules in that as well. If you're looking for Java attacks, PHP attacks, there are different types under each of those categories. 
But each of these categories as a group, they've been um, categorized based on the kind of pattern that they detect. I'm going to be showing us um, some examples of those rule groups as we go uh, as we go on in the presentation. I'm going to hand over to Shabazz now to continue with custom rules. Shabazz, are you there? Hey, uh, thank you, Toby. One second. Okay, I can quickly speak uh, to that. Well, okay, to go on. See my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. All right, so uh, custom rules are uh, basically uh, giving us more granularity on how we can uh, actually restrict traffic <coughs> on Azure VAP. So we have different types of custom rules like match rule uh, and also uh, rate limit rules. So on App Gateway VAP, we only have match rules uh, where we can uh, restrict traffic on client IP based restrictions, uh, geolocation restrictions, size constraints and HTTP parameters like uh, all these uh, parameters that we have listed here and uh, with front door, uh, we also have rate limit uh, type of uh, uh, custom rules where, uh, like I mentioned before, we can limit the uh, number of requests that are coming in a given duration. So that's the end of the rule types actually, and I'm going to uh, start up with uh, WAF tuning here. So what is uh, WAF tuning? Basically, we are putting in some extra efforts to minimize uh, false positives and get the best value out of the WAF engine. So that's one thing. And uh, it is really important for any web application to have the web application firewall tuned to its needs. So uh, not every uh, web application will have similar needs, so we would have to tune our WAF as per the requirement. And then <clears throat> uh, there is a way how we can achieve uh, tuning the WAF. So there is a process for that. So let me go to this next slide, which will clearly explain what we're doing here. So uh, if you look at this picture clearly, we have uh, uh, the left side of things where we are enabling out of the box rule sets and also running the rule sets in prevention mode uh, in the beginning itself. So if we look at the bottom here, uh, that means like there are more uh, chances for false positives to be happening because <clears throat> by design, these uh, out of the box rule sets, they are uh, designed to be strict and any pattern that matches with any malicious activity, it will be dropped. Uh, on the WAF. So it is important for us to tune the WAF rules as per the requirements of the applications. So sometimes even the legitimate traffic will be blocked and we don't want that kind of situation. So how actually to uh, tune our WAF is uh, we can start with running the rules in detection mode. That's the uh, first step. And then once we have uh, run it and uh, we can uh, you know, analyze the log matches, and therefore we can get an idea of uh, what exactly is happening. If there are any false positives, we can take uh, steps towards it. And if there are any uh, other issues, we can also uh, co customize our rules accordingly. So how we can actually do this is there are quite a few approaches here. Uh, we can uh, you know, create a per URI policies or per site policies. Basically, <clears throat> if we have a number of applications uh, behind the app gateway or front door, uh, uh, generally, uh, you know, if you modify any of the uh, custom rules or anything, it is globally it is globally applied, and we don't want that kind of situation. So, creating per site policies per URI policies will give us that uh, granular control over a, a particular URI or site, thereby not affecting the other applications which are behind the app gateway. And uh, similarly, we have other uh, you know restrictions like we can enforce file size limits. Uh, we can create custom rules like we discussed. We can also create exclusion lists. You know, uh, exclusion list is basically, uh, you know, <clears throat> exempting a specific part of the request uh, uh, from being uh, evaluated on the WAF. So uh, that is also there. If at all, we have a requirement for that. And finally, we we can also disable individual rules from the managed rule sets and disable request body inspection. So disabling request body inspection and in individual rules is not highly recommended, but in case there is a need for that, we have the provision for that as well. So let's move on to the next slide, which is uh, talking about exclusion lists, uh, specifically with app gateway here. So <clears throat> like I said before, exclusion list is giving us the ability to uh, exempt uh, from evaluating some part of the request. Uh, like uh, we have quite a few fields here, like request header, request cookie, and request hogs. Basing upon this, we have a, a, around nine fields uh, right now in the app gateway uh, with which we can uh, uh, 
create a rule and uh, uh, you know uh, make an exemption for that particular uh, part of the request. So that is like giving us more control over what we can allow uh, on that uh, WAF po uh, policy. And similarly with exclusion list on the uh, front door, there is a slight difference here. Uh, in the app gateway, we will be able to create exclusion list and that is uh, applied to the whole rule set. But here we have the control over <clears throat> what rule we can apply this uh, exclusion list to. We can apply this to a specific rule set like uh, cross-site scripting rule set or SQLI uh, rule, set, rule set, or else we can also get more uh, granular there and apply it to only a specific rule. Uh, and uh, similar to the app gateway, we have different match variables like uh, request header, uh, cookie and uh, uh, query string and request body post uh, also. So uh, there is quite a few uh, options here and uh, we can make use of those uh, options to actually uh, exempt uh, part of the requests that are coming in as per the need of the application. <clears throat> and then uh, uh, like I mentioned before, there is an approach to disable managed rules with WAF policy as well. Uh, so this is not recommended uh, because if at all you're disabling a particular rule set or a rule in particular, that means you're opening up that vulnerability. So if at all you're going to this for some sort of need of your application, then it's better to do it on a, a you know per site policy or per URI policy, thereby you're not affecting uh, any other applications uh, behind the app gateway. So uh, this there's a simple process. You can just uh, expand the rule set that you have uh, in whatever WAF policy that you're in and just click on disable by selecting those particular rules and you'll be able to disable those rules. And uh, the last one here is uh, creating custom rules with WAF policy. So custom rules, like I mentioned before, there are different types of uh, ways how we can uh, uh, you know create custom rules. Here we have three examples where uh, one is uh, blocking uh, requests from a specific location, China here, uh, uh, for example. Uh, we have uh, other rules which are basically blocking requests from uh, IE 11 or particular version number that we don't want to allow. We also have blocking requests from a particular IP. Uh, so, so this is a very simple configuration. We just have to select the match type and what exactly is the match variable. Here, uh, the match variable is the remote address and country code is whatever country we want to uh, deny here and uh, we can deny or allow this traffic as per our needs. Similarly, uh, there is custom rules provision with front door as well. Uh, like I mentioned before, along with the match rule types, we also have rate limit rule types here. So in this rate limit, like I mentioned, uh, along with the existing uh, uh, you know, match rule types, uh, we can also configure this rate limit rule request here. As we can see, uh, this particular rule will come with a couple of parameters like uh, what is the duration and what is the threshold. So how many requests you want to allow in a particular duration? You can specifically mention that and uh, uh, you know uh, tailor your incoming traffic accordingly. And uh, that is just an overview of how you can tune your WAF. Uh, I would like to hand it over to Toby again to go through a couple of scenarios in which he exactly demonstrates uh, how we can do it. So Toby, all yours. Thank you, Shabazz. Uh, thank you so much. So before I go into the demo, I would like to uh, cover two more slides. Uh, I wanted to mention that because they will be very, very important uh, as we go into the demo. As Shabazz has mentioned, there are some noise that you want to completely remove in your environment so that, first of all, application delivery is improved upon. You want to reduce false positive and you want to completely eliminate access to requests that might be looking for malicious approach to get into your environment. And as I mentioned earlier, we have some of these, these rules have been classified into groups and each of these groups will look at how to check what's inside those group. What do they do? How can I look at what, my, what are the matches in each of these group? How can I reduce access based on that match? How can I create an exclusion to permit something that has that much boys requested because it's currently being flagged by WAF? Now, WAF does not know people as people's application individually, so it has to find a way to say I'm going to deny as much as possible based on how you know my level of sensitivity or my paranoia level. I'm going to block some of this access for you but if you now think this is a legitimate request then you can then find a way to 
uh, either create an exclusion or a custom rule to do that. Also, our bot protection, um, you have different types of bot categorization. So you have some good bots like your search engine, you know, your chat bots, you have the ones used for indexing, for search engine optimization and all of that. You also have some bad bots like Mirai, Reaper, or basically some of those bots that you don't want in your environment. And then there are some unknown bots which currently don't have categorization label. So ours is to look for, okay, is this, based on the kind of pattern and the request that's looking for, is it supposed to be classified as this or that? And then you also have different kind of actions that you can configure for those bots. So the, in fact, bot is a huge problem in itself. Once you can eliminate a lot of bots at more, probably like 40% of the noise in your environment will be reduced. And we'll look into that uh, in a short while. All right, so uh, the, um, the examples that I have here today, I have everything I have tried to uh, create in a blog post. So if you go to aka.ms slash, uh, I'm going to type that here, aka.ms slash WAF tuning, you will find the blog post in there. So this is the web, uh, this is the blog post that goes into detail in case you want to try some of these things out. It will give you good insight into how this works. Uh, I have created four different scenarios. One is for, the first one is for SharePoint, which I won't be, because of time, I won't spend some time on. I'm gonna, uh, the second one is using App Insights to see your, what's going on in the environment. Uh, the third one is WordPress, because a lot of customers use WordPress and they're like, hey, how do I do this? How do I do that? How do I reduce um, this noise going to my environment? And the fourth one is how to use regular expression to look into each of the rules and then see what is being matched, then look for the parameter that is causing the trigger and create exclusion for that parameter. Um, I'm not going to spend time on number one and number three because they are pretty straightforward and they can be found in the blog post. So I want to try to spend some time on the app insights, that's the application insight, which is a tool by Microsoft to see what's going on in your endpoint, with your endpoints. Um, and then I'm going to spend time on number four, as well, which is how to use uh, do use regular expression to look up what's happening in your environment. All right, so let's start with App Insight. And for a start, I have created an application in my environment called .NET App Site. Now, this is just a random <laughs> application. I found it in Azure. So if you go to a quick deployment template, or if you go through the blog post that I mentioned earlier, you will find some. Um, You'll find the link to that. It's a sample.NET application that has been written in ASP.NET, and you can also deploy it to try it out. Now, when I deploy this application, I enabled App Insight for the application. So this is my resource group right here, Toby, and this is the actual application here, .NET App Site. So if I click on the browser, it's gonna load this. Yeah, if I click on this, I can go to the application and see what the application looks like. So this is the application right here. There is no form to fill. There is no link to much. And it's just three pages and it can be at home. You can come to the about page and you can come to the contact page as well. So that's all to the application. Very simple. In fact, if you click on this learn more, it takes you outside the application. So if I click learn more here, it takes me to somewhere else. So basically it's just a three page application, simple enough to get it done what I want to do. But when I was deploying this application, I was able to deploy, um, I was able to enable application insight with it. And what that gives me is, I'm trying to, again, like I mentioned, we're trying to reduce the noise in our environment. And first of all, you need to see what kind of noise is coming to this environment. I have shown you this application because I wanted you to understand what the application does. And then you begin to see the kind of request that is going to that application. First of all, I deployed this application alone. I did not publish it to anybody. I did not until maybe last night when I posted it in the blog. So of course, I'm not expecting a lot of requests to be in the application, but let's see what's been happening so far uh, in the application that I deployed. So I can come here, I can check in the last one hour, I can check in the last seven days. I deployed this application last week. And if I go into the last seven days, I can check my failures in the last seven days. Now, this is the number of hits I've had in the last seven days, over 6,000. And out of that, I've had one or two failed. So what's happening is my application has had to process each of these requests. Now, whether they serve error 400, 
for uh, uh, the path not being available, or error 403 for resource not being available, or whatever error that's above 399 <laughs> that they are serving. The most important part is these requests are still getting to my web application, and I want to reduce this as much as possible. So if I look at all these failures that I have in my environment, I can see that, okay, out of all of these failures, I have had I have had over, uh, about four error, four, uh, error 404 at least 112 times in the last 24 hours alone. If I go in the last seven days, I can see that I've had over 240 of those and I've had error 400 at least twice. So what I can do is if I come to the one that is very high, now in your own environment, you might have thousands of these because your application has probably been there for like a year. So if I go to this error 404 now, I can begin to look into the error 404 and say, okay, which of these uh, do I know it in my environment? If I look into this, I can see Outlook Web Access. Like I mentioned earlier, this is just an ASP.NET. I don't have anything to do with Outlook here. It has no access to any mail. It's not a website for my company whereby I can say, okay, maybe slash admin and then have a login for my email Outlook or Exchange whatsoever. So the first thing I can do by looking into that is, okay, if I'm having Outlook Web Access requests, there must be a reason why that response is coming. Where is it coming from? And how can I res restrict that access? So I can come here and I can see that, okay, the request is coming by appending OWA authentication slash logon. So whoever wrote, crafted that has added, concatenated this URI from here to my website. So probably the way that script works is look for the FQDN of that application, then append this to it, because most likely out there in the wild, there will always be a website that if you apply this to the end, it will give you the login page of that company's mail exchange. So you can try to, you know, try a post force attack or whatever it is what you want, what you want to do. So in this case, I can create a custom rule and say, let my WAP completely deny this URI. So by taking this URI, I can use the WAP to say, okay, you're not even going to get to my application at all. Instead of my application processing this request every time, let the WAF not even let it get there at all. So you do that for that, and then you can go back again and keep checking around and say, okay, what else is in my environment that you know I don't need? It's not supposed to be there. So WordPress index. So again, like I said, this is just an ASP.NET. The same thing, if I see a uh, .php request coming in here, which I saw a couple of days ago, and it was huge, it was been overridden now because you know there's been more failures. I can go into my environment and create each of these as custom rules or exclusions to remove those. So that's what App Insight is able to do for you. If you don't have App Insight in your environment, you can also go to our GitHub, which is what uh, which we had mentioned earlier, which is um aznetsec. That's aka.ms slash Azure Network Security. So if you go here, we have our um, Azure WAF here, and you can go to the monitor workbook. So you can use the monitor workbook for something similar. And if you deploy this with just one click, you are able to see what's going on in your environment. You can see where most of the request is coming from, what endpoints they are going to. And if you already use this and you want to do more, you want to go further, there is another second workbook that you can also use to triage. And the second workbook here goes further and it gives you more insight into what's happening in your environment. There's a blog post to that as well. You can click it and see how it works. What this workbook does and takes further is, it tells you that this is the kind of request coming to your environment. Uh, I'm gonna give you a link to read more on that type of request. And then when you read more, I'm gonna suggest, action. I'm, I'm gonna show you where to go to, where you can find actions that you can take. Do you wanna blog, do you wanna log it, or do you want to you know, just allow that access? to be available in your environment. So this second um, workbook also does that for you. Again, this is in our WAF, in, uh, in our WAF repository. All right, so that's for App Insight. And uh, the SharePoint one here, I'm gonna just quickly speak over it. What the SharePoint does is, for a lot of customers who use SharePoint, if your environment, if you don't have like an SQL or a, a database, it could be, it could be a non-relational database, say MariaDB or MongoDB. If you don't have any database at the end, it's just SharePoint. You use it to serve maybe instructions or create uh, like a directory of what's going on in your environment. Basically, just like you know, a Teams page. Now, the there is a there is an API API design guideline with that. And what Microsoft, what we have told customers to try to do is try to design your 
environment this way, such that if you follow this guideline, when requests are made based on the CDN you're using, for instance, if you're requesting a picture, when the picture is being served, the, the location of that resource, of that image that is being served back would be showing the CDN URL. So the CDN will create a URL and serve that back as the location of that image. Now, that would be what it would do. Instead of providing the registry access, basically, what is the address parameter of where that place is stored, of where that picture is stored? Instead of providing that information of you know, database name, the location, where it could be found, is it the first object in the table? Instead of providing any suggestive address whatsoever, it will provide the CD, CDA will create a URL resource locator for you, and that's what will be served back, basically masking out the information that somebody might be using to create like um, a, so, a, a forgery path for you. So that's what the SharePoint is about. Uh, the one about WordPress is basically, I mentioned an example of uh, a common trigger in WordPress, which is a WordPress underscore post. Now, because that the way WP underscore post as a string is uh, structured together, it's able to trigger its SQL injection. So by using that to create an exclusion, by using that string to create an exclusion, you can prevent that access or, I mean, that request from being triggered. So I created that. So like I said, I'm going to just focus on app inside, which is number two, and regular expression lookup, which is number four. Now let's look at the uh, regular expression lookup. So this, the first one here is a rule. And like I mentioned earlier, I was going to show you how to look up this rule. If you have looked into your logs, for instance, in my case here, I can go into my logs. So if I go into my app gateway, because my application is currently hosted in my app gateway, and to show you that my application is currently hosted in app gateway, I can take my app gateway's public IP, and I can show how I'm currently publicizing the same application. So this is the direct access to the application, and this is the application access that goes through the URI, which is so sorry, through the app gateway. Now that said, how do I show the difference in what app gateway WAP is able to prevent in terms of noise compared to when you're just hosting your just publishing your application directly? Now this is my app gateway access here. First of all, let me see what the logs look like for the app gateway. So if I go into my logs, now uh, let me run this. Uh, so these are the two, let me look, uh, so based on the two that I'm looking for, I have already done a couple of tests and I can see that 942.120 and 942.130 are three are two signatures that are very common in my environment. Now, both of them are examples of SQL injections. So like I said earlier, SQL injection will have a rule group and there will be different types of SQL injection attacks under that group. And to see that, I can anything that starts with 942 is SQL. So the first three um, uh, uh, numbers tell you what kind of attack it is. So if I come in here and I go to rules here, or if I just come into the directory and I click on rules, I can see those rule categories. So if it says 942, it's already, I already know it's a SQL injection attack. If it's 941, I already know that it's a cross scripting attack. If it's, you know, and so on and so forth. If it says it's 932, I know it's remote code execution attack. Now, if I click on 932, I can then say, okay, what type of remote code execution is it? I can see if it's 932105, is it 106? So that's the first thing you need to know. First of all, is what kind of attack is this? What does it say? Of course, the logs provide some information that I can also use as well. So if I drill down in this here, I can see that it's telling me that I'm currently using 3.2 as my rule set version. That's my CRS. And I can see the rule that's currently being matched. I can see the pattern that's matching it. So it's up to me to now say, okay, what does this pattern mean? What does this pattern look out for? I can take this regular expression. I can look into it if you understand regular expression very well. If you don't, uh, you can use chat GPT and ask chat GPT, what does this regular expression, what does it match? Or you can, you know, talk to somebody or basically, but well, for me, I think I have an idea of what this is supposed to look for. So this, from this, I can tell you that it's a, what it's telling me is that there's some characters in here, and some of those characters, if they happen to occur up to 12 times, it's going to trigger. So if I look at this, I can easily tell that because you know I have worked on this a few times. But if it's most my first time, how would I know? 
that's the whole idea of this webinar. How do I know what to look out for? How do I know what to remove? How do I know what to filter out? So like I said, you need to first of all take this value and then go and search that. Okay, this is the pattern that matched, but what did this pattern match in my request? Now, if you look at the details data as well, it, this is this one now tells you what was actually matched in your request. So in this case, something has been matched by a pattern. The first thing you want to know is what is the pattern and what was matched. So the logs is able to tell you that information. The rule ID is able to tell you the rule. The OWASP mod security, because mod security is open source, is able to give you insight into what kind of rule it is. So in my case, I want to look for uh, one of these two rules. Okay, we're running out of time. I want to look for, first look for 942430. Now, 942430, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is a kind of rule that looks for occurrences up to 12 times of some, of, of some particular characters. Now, what character was appearing 12 times and which of the, and this is not just one character, if the accumulative of any of those characters, if they occur 12 times, is going to trigger it. So what I can do is I can go and look for that rule 942430. I can come in here and look for that rule. Again, I'll go back to my rules. It starts with 942, I can go to 942, and then I can search for 942430. 942430. Now, this is the rule right here. And like I mentioned earlier, this is this rule just look for a combination of this pattern. Basically, if I have um, a steric coming before a, a backslash, if I have a backslash this way, if I have a plus sign, equal sign, if I have ampersand, if I have all of these values in here, if I have these values in here, I have to, and they occur together at different times, whether individually or cumulatively in different spreads, 12 times, this rule is going to be triggered. So what I can do is I can take this rule here, I copy this rule, and I can look for a tool that can help me do a pattern match. And such an example is regex101, right? So if you go to regular expression 101, I can take my pattern match, and then I can put that pattern match right here, and then I can say, what was triggered for instance let me do a quick example of something if i take a uh if i copy my url say if i have a url that has for example this kind of characters example i can see that from here it begins to detect some of these characters that are in here which is like you know the double code the single code you know all of that open base close base um you can see all of them there. <laughs> I can count up to those and up to 12. Now, if I continue from here <clears throat> and the request has other parameters, say um, uh, forward slash parameter name, param equal to, you know, some sample, say no, whatever. Nothing else is triggering except this part. So, so that means if I take my message that was triggered and I put it in here, it should tell me what was triggered. So I can go back into my logs and say, okay, I am being told that this is the match data. In my match data, something else was triggering in it. So what in this match data currently triggered this rule? I can post that in here, and then it will tell me which of those occur, which of those occurred 12 times to trigger the rule. That's <clears throat> number one. Uh, let me see. So for instance, if I have a URL that looks like this, which I'm going to use to do a test real quick. Uh, let me give you, let me do an example. Uh, so let's say I have, I decided that this is my website here and I go to about. Now, if I decide that I want to, you know, create a parameter maybe on the page to be served and that parameter I'm saying, okay, uh, uh, create a parameter name and call it marketing. So something like marketing should be served when this is called. I'm just, this is just example. So this goes just fine. Marketing will go just fine. But the moment something else happens, and that parameter called marketing changes to something that has 12 characters that is currently in that list that I mentioned earlier. Now, if I do this and I, um, let me see if I can inspect my page real quick here. Now, if I do the same thing, second.
So if I go back to my uh, WAF and I do the same thing, but now I apply, I am applying, sorry, one second right here. Oh, I already created that, so sorry, excuse me. I created an exclusion to permit this as part of my test. So uh, if well, once I remove my, so I created an exclusion to permit this request so that it won't be triggered. It's so it won't be triggered. If I remove that exclusion, um, I believe that should be in my web web application firewall. That was supposed to be the next stage um, of my test. So this is a exclusion I created so that that will be not that will be allowed because on a regular day that would have been triggered in my environment again like I mentioned earlier because I'm using these parameters here and these parameters which are changed from marketing to this which contain these symbols which add up to 12. Now this is now this so um let me post this what I actually pasted which in case you can't see it in that in that URL was this. This is what actually pasted in that URL. But if you look at these characters, because uh, a single quote is a single quote like this is equivalent to um, percentage 27 in ASCII because you can't put a quote in your URL. So your URL is going to convert it to percentage 27%. So it's going to do that. And that's why you're seeing this 27 here, 27 here, 27 here. So quote plus all of these values, they are always changed because your URL can't take them. And it's super important to bear that in mind when you're creating your exclusion as well. Okay, now, so this is going because I've created an exclusion to permit it. But once I remove that exclusion, which is what will be your own default state. Now, this is the exclusion I created, which is to use that parameter name to create an exclusion. Let me remove that exclusion for a second there. And, okay, so my exclusion is gone. I don't, oh, is it still there? One second. Okay, so my exclusion is gone. And now if I come back to, my home page here, and I do a refresh on this page. Now it's forbidden. So it's forbidden because it is being triggered because of this tool over here. And you can see that that's what's happening. If I go into my logs, I will see that my app gateway, which is my work, my app gateway, has been able to successfully block this, which is what it should do. But in the case where you have a reason, now you might have a reason, you'll be surprised. So for instance, when you do SAML, or single sign on in your environment, it comes with so many characters, and each of these characters can easily accumulate to 12 of this type of triggering characters. So you can use an exclusion like I just did, create that exclusion in your WAF and use that to permit it, like I did earlier, which was permitted until I removed it. So, um, like I said earlier, you can use exclusion. You can also create a custom rule. If I look into my log here, uh, where's my log again? Okay, I already closed that log phase. So if I look into my log, I can see the request URI. Uh, my app gateway. So I can use a custom rule. Custom rule is, people always ask, what is the difference between custom rule and exclusion in terms of usage? Some things that you need to know is, uh, custom rule is much more granular. Custom rule is much more granular than exclusion. You can concatenate um, more conditions in the custom rule. So you can have your request header as a condition, and then you can have your request URI, as a URI path as another condition. And then you can also create allow or deny. So you can deny, you can allow in custom rule. In exclusion, you're permitting because by default, there's a trigger. And that trigger is restricting access into your environment. So exclusions explicitly means that you're creating an exclusive right for this request to go through. But in custom rule, you can do allow and deny. Then the last one is you can also create a redirect in custom rule, you can't do a redirect in exclusion. Custom rule gives you access opportunity to create a redirect. So if something happens, say like a trigger, you can tell that, okay, once this kind of trigger happens, do a redirect and give them this custom page and say, um, you are trying, uh, this is being um, suggested as an attack, uh, please refrain from attacking this resource or something like that. You can create a custom response and send it out in your custom rule. So um, we're out of time right now. So that's that. Uh, the second one I wanted to do was uh, this particular rule here, which is 942120. 942120, just look for certain words in your uh, in your request. And the words it looks for are words like um, a concatenation of is null, um, XOR, 
uh, is not. So any of these kind of combinations, if it's in your request, is going to be triggered. So you can find more information, uh, uh, more examples of that in aka.ms slash WAF tuning, which is the blog post that was written about this, um, this presentation. And you can get all of the, those examples, as I mentioned earlier, I configure some of those. And you see the application inside, the one which we just discussed. Um, you see the pattern match, the examples I just did. You see all of those in the blog post. Uh, I'm already three minutes over the time. I, I was giving like five to six minutes to talk about maybe some common questions that might have occurred during this presentation. But, um, but yeah, so I will leave the next five minutes for questions. Great, thank you. Um, the team's been great with answering all the questions. Uh, I do think there are a few worth reiterating. Um, the first one is, uh, can WAF be used for Azure VMs or has like Azure functions, for example, blocking an IP address that is performing brute force? Yes, this is a very, very good question. And um, yes, you can. The first thing you need to do is, in that case, I would advise you to use a, um, our workbook, which I've shown you how to get to in our repository. It can easily just show you with a visualization which particular public IP address has the highest, you know, the modal value in terms of this particular IP address is certainly maybe 100,000. We also have a Sentinel detection workbook. So that playbook is, all of this will be automated for you. You wouldn't have to do a thing. So there's the manual part component to this, and there is automated component to this. So the automated component is, there is a playbook, looks for these IP addresses. There's a threshold that has been set in that playbook. And once requests is coming more than seems natural, or based on that threshold that's been set, for example, 200 requests per minute, 2000 requests per minute. So, they, you know, that's that's a bit, you know, questionable. So what it does is it highlights that public IP address. It creates an automated rule and then it sends you a request based on maybe previous pattern. Now, okay, do you want me to ask, um, allow or deny this public IP address? So you can go through that automated path or you can go to custom rule, like I mentioned earlier. And in custom rule, you can easily just, you know, use your rate limiting, uh, you can, create a custom rule here, and you can say block the IP address if you want to completely block the IP address away. So you can create a public address and then use the match type here to be IP address. You can use numbers, you can use string, you can use geolocation to completely restrict access. So if I choose geolocation, it will choose um, remote address and which country is it that I'm trying to come from. So that public IP address from that particular country, any public IP address from that, public con that country will be restricted by applying deny. And if you have the public IP address, as in you actually have the value, you can come in here and actually type in the public IP address as well. So I hope that helps. You can do it manually or you can do it. You can use the automated detection for that. Great, thank you. Our next question is, can WAF be used to protect on-prem apps or apps hosted in third-party clouds? Yes, good question, amazing question. We actually had a webinar last week and we talked about um, applications that are hosted in third-party cloud environment. And we did uh, AWS, we did GCP, and you can put those applications behind your hub gateway and then use the WAF. And we know that there are so many reasons why you want to do that. If your baseline has been created around the WAF in Azure and you have you know, done your assessment, you have created Azure policies, you have your uh, GRC and comp all these compliance tools that you have set in place, and you don't want to do all of those in the other cloud, probably because of inavailability or for different reasons, you know, you can do that. So um, my team is probably pro provide a link where you can find that presentation. But yes, and if you come also to that same blog uh, where we have our tech community blog post here, you will find that, um, you will find a couple of posts on GCP and AWS. So basically, yes, the answer to that question is yes. And uh, I think this first question was on-prem. So yes, that's correct. Uh, as long as you can put the application behind your app gateway or your front door, yes. And your app gateway lets you put, um, it allows you to put uh, based on, you can use a public IP, you can use app service. So in that case, if you're currently published, depending on how your application is currently being published, is it being published in a VM, in a server? How are you publishing your application? As long as that is available as a backend option in your environment, then you should be able to, um, yes, you should be able to add that. So you can, these are the options available. Is the app service, is the VM skill set, is the virtual machine, is the IP address or FQDN? 
FQDS. So you, I can always put my own um, probylabs.com. That's that's valid. Um, shameless plug. But yeah, so you can see I can always put this currently doesn't exist in Azure. This is my environment. And so I can put that in there and I can always add that. And that's it. Oh, I have to give it a name. So yes, the answer to that question is yes. Great. Thank you. Uh, and our last question is, can WAF be used to prevent zero day vulnerabilities? So um, one of the things that we do at uh, uh, at Microsoft is to make sure that we have access to as much security information as much as possible. And uh, some of the ways that we do that is we have uh, threat intelligence being currently integrated with our most of our platforms from Azure Firewall, our gateway front door. And what threat intelligence does is Threat intelligence, they have their own APIs by which they get like different um, information as it happens, as it occurs, as much as possible. And as long as the threat intelligence database is activated as fast as possible, we will be protected because we have an integration with this platform. So we are leveraging on other security platforms within Azure and within Microsoft to get access to information as soon as they are possible about security attacks in the whole security landscape. Great. Uh, well, that seems to be all the questions that we had. Uh, so I'd like to thank Shabazz and Toby for being our guests today and for an excellent presentation. And thank you to the rest of the team who helped answer questions. At the same time, I would like to remind the listeners that the best way to ensure you don't miss any future webinars or major announcements is to visit our landing page at aka.ms slash security community. And while there, you'll find easy ways to navigate and find the resources and learning content relevant to our security products and their communities. A good start would be browsing our bite-sized product videos, ninja trainings, recordings of past webinars, GitHub communities, and more. We love to hear your feedback on how we can improve these webinars. Please take a minute submitting your webinar feedback at aka.ms slash Azure NetSec feedback. Thank you and see you next time. Goodbye.